Yes. Psalms 138, verse 6. And we're just going to continue. Hopefully you didn't think I was just, just talking those first few minutes. We're, we're going to just continue in the same thought. 138, 6, it says, Though the Lord be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly. Amen. Everybody say, that's me. I don't know if that was everybody, but I'll just believe that it was. <laughs> he, is, he is high, but the Bible says that though he is high, he has respect unto the lowly. Or, or another word that, that that could be, be there is the humble. He respects the humble. There's something about humble people and, and humility that I believe just attracts God like a magnet. Amen. That he, even in his high place, as high as high can be, the highest throne, uh, the ruler of all of the earth, of all of the kings, the creator, when he sees somebody who's truly humble, who truly makes themselves low, lowly, he has a respect for that. He, he recognizes that. But on the flip side, the proud, he knoweth afar off. That's why I, I feel like, looking at it in contrast, I feel like that the humble is, is like, like that magnet that he's close to, just attracts him. Because the prideful, he knows them still, but he knows them at, at arm's length. He knows them as a little bit further of a distance away. Because there's something that we, I, I believe, see in this verse, something about pride that God himself just can't stand. He just doesn't like. And uh, I can't say that I blame him. <laughs> Man, if, you, if you've ever met anybody, and, and don't look around the room, but if you've ever met anybody that has any amount of pride and it, and it shows strongly, then you, you know it's just it's not very fun to be in their presence for a very long amount of time. Amen. And, and we see this principle even with God himself. I think, man, no way God would know somebody from afar off. It's what the word says, man. Turn with me to, to Matthew chapter 18. Matthew 18 and verse Verse 3 here. Actually, let's, let's start with verse number 1. Matthew 18 and verse 1. This all fits, fits together. The disciples, they came unto Jesus saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Jesus. You know, we're, we're kind of curious. We've been, we've been talking and, you know, we... We must have a little bit of humility in us because you've chose to bring us close to you. You've chose to have us in your inner circle. And we're kind of curious, with you being the king and all, who's, who's going to be the greatest with you in the kingdom of heaven? And verse 2, Jesus, he, he thought this would be a good time for an illustrative sermon. And so he calls up a, a little child. To come and comes unto him. And he set this little child in, in the middle of, of all of these grown men, all of these disciples. And he says unto them, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted or except you be changed and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. And what does he what does he mean? By this, well, I, I feel like verse verse four is kind of the explanation of that. It says that who whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Man, whoever humbles himself like this little child, that's the one that'll be the greatest. Not the one that has the greatest accomplishments. Not the one that's seen on the day of Pentecost. 
helping people to come to the revelation of me, but he who is the least will be the greatest. And again, I, I feel like this is one of those, those biblical, scriptural kingdom principles that we, we've all probably heard. We all know with our, with our head, at least. But I think that, at least if you're anything like me, we need the reminder probably every other day. <laughs> he who's least is greatest. He who's lowly, God is respect. God respects. Amen. Because, again, the, the flip side of this is somebody that God is far off from, that God knows at a distance. And we have, a, we have another scripture for this in case you're someone who, who may make the argument that that's just something in the Old Testament. Amen. The book of James Chapter 4 here. James chapter 4 and verse 6. James 4 and 6 says, But he gives more grace. I'm thankful for grace. Amen. Before I before we read the rest of that, I want to ask this this question, and maybe we can show be a show of hands. How many in the room have ever prayed for grace from God? Half of us, three quarters, about. Amen. I've I've prayed for grace. I I I'll be honest. That's one of the things I I try to pray almost daily. God, I receive of your grace. I need your grace. I know that it's by your grace working through me that I even have the desire to, to do the things that you want me to do. And I know for sure it's the grace working through me that makes me able to do the things that you want me to do. And so, God, I really need a big portion of grace today, man, because I have a, a big portion of humanity, have a big amount of, of flesh, of carnality that I need to offset to be able to hopefully fulfill and, and do your will. And so I, I do. I, I, again, like many of you, I'm sure, pray this often. Pray, God, I need your grace. Give me your grace. And something that, again, I think the Lord is showing me and hopefully will be showing us is maybe a more, a more, I almost said more better, more better prayer would be, we'll just go with that, my Arkansas coming out. A more better prayer would be to pray, God, help me to be humble. Man, because as, we, as we're going to read here, I'm getting ahead of myself, but as we're going to read, those who are, are humble, God gives grace to. And so I, I having this, I'm having this revelation and understanding that I can pray for the grace of God every day and all day long and still have pride in myself, and that prayer is not really going to do a whole lot unless hopefully it's humbling me in the process of praying it, realizing, man, I really, really need this, so, okay, here's some areas that I'm not letting go, as Brother Lewis said. Here's some areas that I need to give him greater control so that his grace can work in those things. Man, let's, let's continue to read here, verse 6. This is, this is similar to what we read in, in Psalms. It says that God resisteth the proud, but he giveth grace unto the humble. That's quite the, quite the contrast there, that somebody who is, is proud, somebody who's prideful, that God himself, the, the King of kings, the Lord of Lords, the creator of the universe, that God would not just, as it says in Psalms, know them from afar off, but that God would resist them. I don't know what that does in you, but that, that causes a spotlight to immediately illuminate inside of me and start searching. God, where is any bit of pride? Because I, I know there's some, I know there's some left in here. It's Pride, it's just a sneaky little rascal that's, 
tries to hide in the darkest corners of my heart, of my life. So God, search me, find, help me to find those things because, man, I, I don't know what life would be like with you resisting me. And I know that I'm sure many of us have experienced that, maybe whether we realized it or not. We've, we've been battling, and I, I feel like it, as, I was, as I was praying just in, in preparation for tonight, I felt like the Lord prompted this to me that, that there's probably even in this room tonight many who are, you're battling, you're, you're fighting, you're struggling, you're, you're resisting, and you think that it's, you think it's the devil that you're resisting. You think it's the devil that you're pushing up against that's just coming after you, that's, that's full force, just has a, all of hell trying to attack you. But in reality, it's your pride that you're fighting with. And because of that pride, you're feeling the resistance of God in your life and some of your own ideas, some of your own plans that you're like, God, but... But this, I really want to do this. I really think this is the best thing. And I'm going to, even though I don't feel peace with it, even though I, I don't feel your grace in it, I'm going to keep pushing forward. I'm going to keep just doing what I think is, is right for me. And it's, you're wondering, man, why is this so hard? I, I see all these other people doing it. I, I see that it's possible. I see it's, it's, it's a way that could be successful. And, and God is just standing there. Feel like with his hand out, can you can picture kind of the cartoon, the bigger character with their hand on the smaller character's head, who's trying to just run forward, and they're being held, held in place. They're they're exerting all of their energy, all of their might to just to run, to move forward, and and that force that is so much greater than them just standing there, saying, "Nope, this is not the way." you're supposed to be going. This is not the thing that you're supposed to be doing. Let's continue to read here just a couple more verses. Verse 7 says, to submit yourselves, and I want to stop here for just a moment because you've all probably heard this, but I, I, I think that it's everywhere in the New Testament that it says to submit. It says it's followed by yourself. And same goes for humble. In most places in the New Testament that, that it says to humble, it's followed by yourself. So in case you think this is anybody else's responsibility tonight, again, turn that spotlight on yourself. Let the Word of God be, be the mirror that it's intended to be right back at yourself, to see the areas in you that need to be dealt with, that need to be addressed, that need to be submitted to God. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God and resist the devil. That's what we should be doing. If we're submitted to him, we should be resisting the devil and, and knowing that if we do that, he will flee from you. Uh, one, one last place here. It's pretty similar in the wording, them, them quoting Psalms and seems like they're almost quoting each other. First Peter chapter five and verse five. The Bible says that likewise you younger submit yourselves unto the elder. Man, I'm thankful for our elders in the church who are spiritual authority, but also just our elders who are older than I am. I, I submit myself to to them who who can come alongside me and say, hey, man, like, that was kind of dumb, what you did the other day. <laughs> and I want to be submitted enough to say, even if you're not my elder, I submit myself unto you to be able to receive that. <laughs> and know that if they see that, if they felt that, there's probably some truth to it. Amen? That, that they're not against me, that they don't want to hurt me. But they want to see me be humble and have grace from God. So submit yourselves to the elders, but it goes on. In case you thought you could get away with just the elders, it says, and be subject one to another. 
So that's all of us. Be subject one to another. If somebody feels, feels the need to humbly correct you, to humbly give you a simple word of, of advice that, that you feel. And, and isn't, that, isn't that the funny thing about correction, about, about advice that just hits a little too close to home? Is when, when it's connected to, to pride inside of us, often our response is to, if, if we were a chicken, to ruffle our feathers, <laughs> to flare up our back. To, to say, hey, wait a second, who do, you, who do you think you're talking to? And I, again, I know this is basic, but I think that we should, we should have the maturity as Christians to acknowledge, hey, if I'm rising up in that way, when it's, whether it's the word of God, whether it's a brother, whether it's a sister, if I'm rising up in that way, my proverbial feathers, whenever I'm spoken to like that, then that's an area I need to examine and say, hey, God, I'm, I'm going to get in your word, and I want it to search me because I don't want you to be resisting me because I have any traces of pride that are hiding out inside of me. And because it's, it's so easy for that to happen, so easy for us to, to justify ourselves because we just think we're always right. <laughs> The Word of God talks a little bit about that too. Amen. Um, finishing here quickly, it says, and be clothed with humility. And I want some, some humble, humble garments, some humble, humble clothing. Maybe, phys- maybe physically, naturally, and spiritually. I'll just leave, leave that alone. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. There it is again. There's a two or three witnesses for you tonight in the word of God. Verse 6, humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. That, that's the key right there, in due time. In due time. What, it, what, is, what is due time that you get exalted well, first of all, it comes after you've humbled yourself under the mighty hand of God. And then it's whenever he says it's time. <laughs> whenever he says, okay, it's due time. They've put themselves under my hand. They're not getting hurt, offended. They've, they've worked that bitterness out of them. They, they're under my hand and people can correct them without them getting mad. People can talk to them. People can even talk bad about them, and they're okay. They're waiting. They're humble. They're content because they know that that means they're closer to me, and that, I think, is a better thing. That's a more important thing than being right, than picking a fight, than correcting somebody else or than not taking correction from somebody else, knowing that we can be closer to him because of our humility, should be enough of a reason to desire humility. And knowing that the opposite of that means he's resisting us should be enough of a reason for us to humble ourselves, to come into that, that throne room every single day, every single morning and say, God, I know if I let a few more minutes of this day pass by that I'll be exalted above measure and so I'm going to nip it in the bud here first thing in the morning, and I'm falling on my, on my face, falling on my knees, humbling myself to you, God, because you were high, you were lifted up, and I'm lowly, I'm, I'm but dust, but dust. It's another, that's, I think that's another one of those things that, that we know we're made of, but we can maybe forget sometimes. We're just dust from the ground that he chose to form us out of and breathe his breath into. Man, we, we only have life because of him. And I want, it, I want to have a life that's close to him. I want to have a life that's not resisted by him. 
Last, last verse here, after we've humbled ourselves under the hand of God, last verse says, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Man, we, we as humans can have a tendency to just hold on to things. And Brother Lewis alluded to it right when he started. There's some things that we need to just let go of. It might be, it, maybe it is offenses. Maybe it is bitterness. Maybe it is something somebody said about you or that you think they said about you or whatever. Whatever it may be, I promise you, promise you, it's not worth holding on to because the result of holding on to that will be God resisting you. The result of, of us carrying our cares, thinking that, you know what, I got it. I've got this figured out. I've got this under control. I've got this handled. The result of that is being resisted by God himself. And that's, that's a place that I, I never want to be in. That's a place I don't even want to. I don't even want to flirt with that. I don't even want to want to be in the neighborhood of that. And so I again, this is just for me, but some days that requires some pretty long prayer meetings. <laughs> some days that requires me being on my face quite a while, and I don't get it right every day. I promise you, there's some days I get up from that lowly place way sooner than I should. But you know what? The next day, hopefully every day, I go right back to that place. Because I know it, it just, takes, just takes a moment. just takes one moment for that pride to rise back up. Again, it's a place I don't want to be. And so I, I, I finish with this before I pass, pass this over to to other flowers. Again, going back to, to what I said a few moments ago, I, I, really, I really did. I felt this in, in prayer that, that there's some things that we may be wrestling, fighting, pushing against, resisting, feeling like, God, what is going on here? What's going on with the situation? I've been, been battling this so long. I, shouldn't I have defeated this by now? And I feel like that I have the answer for you tonight to that battle, to that thing that you're pushing up against, to that thing that you're fighting. Humble yourself. Humble yourself under his hand, man, and he'll give you grace. He'll give you grace here, here's the thing. Even if whatever you're facing is the devil, humbling yourself will get you the grace enough to resist him. And if it's a brother, if it's a sister, humbling yourself will still get you the grace that you need to not fight them, <laughs> to not just smack them, <laughs> to not retaliate, right? His vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. It's not his churches. <laughs> Amen. I, I, I feel the Holy Ghost tonight in, in talking about this. Can we, before I hand this over, can we just close our eyes? I wonder if we can. This, this might be a little bit, a little bit awkward, but before you, before you pray, um, no, we were not Catholic. I think we all know that. If you've ever been here, if you've been here for five minutes. But, I, again, I had this cross my mind before, the, before service, and I wonder if those are willing and those who are able. If, as we close our eyes, would, would you be willing to just right where you are in your seat to just lean forward and to just kneel before the Lord? Say, God, this is just a simple thing, just a small thing. But God, in my physical posture, I want to come into your throne room, God, and tonight to say, to acknowledge that you're the king, that you're the Lord of lords, that you're the great I am. Amen. Jesus, we humble ourselves. 
God, we humble ourselves before you. We're lowly, Jesus. We're nothing, God, without you. And we don't want to be resisted, Jesus, but we want your grace. We desire your grace, Jesus. We need your grace in this hour. We need your grace for everything that we face in our day. We need your grace, Jesus, to make it through another day. I pray that we would release what needs to be released tonight. God, I pray we would release all of our pride. I pray we would release any unforgiveness. I pray we would release any bitterness to you, Jesus. That all of our cares would be cast upon you. That every weight, that every sin would be laid at your feet tonight. At your feet where we need Oh God, I pray that it would all be left at this altar. It would all be left before you, Jesus, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. Amen. I'll let you be seated. If you'll stay there in James, or sorry, 1 Peter chapter 5. I appreciate what the Lord is speaking to us tonight. I pray that you are receiving what God is wanting to speak to us, is speaking to us. Go to verse 5. I'm just going to read and and quickly um, remind you what the Lord is saying here. First Peter 5 and 5 starts with the word likewise, and that's a continuation word, a conjunction, I suppose. It's a long one, but it's a conjunction. Joining the, the previous thought, the chapter starts talking to the elders about elders doing the elders' job. And then it says, likewise. So just like the elders are supposed to do the elders' job, you younger submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud. Everybody say resisteth. God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Verse 6, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. Go to verse 7, casting all your care upon him for he careth for you. Now let me just pause and say the, um, the posture that you were just in physically and spiritually is a great posture to cast 
not physically to throw. I don't know that you can throw something as well or as far when you're kneeling like that. But spiritually, emotionally, and mentally to cast, to, to put something onto God. You're basically saying, I can't do anything more with this. So, Lord, you have to take it from here. This is explaining how we humble ourselves, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. Now, I want you to keep reading. The next verse, I feel like, is where the Lord is really wanting to bring some understanding, knowing all that he's set up to this point. Verse 8 says, be sober, be vigilant. Now, don't, don't check out and don't think that we're going to a different lesson. This is the same message. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil. I need you to see that phrase, your adversary, the devil. One more time. Your adversary, the person that is opposed to you, the person that is trying to beat you, the one that wants to destroy you. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Now the next verse. Whom resist. Everybody say resist. Who are we resisting? The devil. Your adversary, the devil, whom resist steadfast in the faith. This is, I, I'm not going to take long, and, and I've only got two words. This is one of them, resist. Resist steadfast in the faith. Who are we resisting? The devil, your adversary. This is important for you to realize. I don't know how I grew up with the misunderstanding and just in my own mind thinking you're supposed to run away from the devil. I know how, because the Bible says flee, but it does not ever say flee the devil, okay? It doesn't say flee the devil. You cannot outrun the devil. You can't run away from him. And that's not the posture you're ever supposed to take. What you are supposed to flee, this is in Timothy, flee youthful lust. And another place it says flee idolatry. So there are things you're supposed to run away from. But those things are not the devil. When you see evil, you just know, I'm not sticking around. I'm going to flee. I'm going to run away from this. I, I'm not going to allow myself to participate and partake. That is a, the right approach to take to something like lust or idolatry. To hightail it out of there. But it's not the approach you take every day in your Christian walk with God against the devil. You, 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 against. I use the word against. You can't run against something. It's kind of like that image that, that Brother Hart used of you running into somebody that's holding you on the head. That's what it means to run against or run against a wall, right? That doesn't make a lot of sense. So what do you do against something? You resist steadfast. That's what the scripture says here. Your adversary, you got to be sober. You got to be vigilant. That means you've got to be watchful in your right mind. No, that doesn't mean run. That doesn't mean flee. That doesn't mean try to stay away from. It means be aware. So you've got to be sober and vigilant so you can resist steadfast. In the faith. Go to James chapter 4, verse 7. When, when Brother Hart was reading this passage, these are the two words that the Lord just really hit me with. I already told you one of them is resist. 
Resist, again it says the same thing right here in this verse. Resist the devil. Everybody say resist. Resist the devil. And he will flee from you. I, I told you, I, I, I had the misconception that, that I'm supposed to flee from him. All the, You cannot live your life running from the devil. He, he, either he'll just let you run, or he'll wait till you get tired, and then he'll get right back on your case again. If that's your posture, is just trying to run, 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 get away from, stay away from eventually, hear me in the Holy Ghost, eventually you will have to resist. Instead of running, instead of trying to hide from and living fearfully, you will have to turn and stand against the devil. Resist the devil and he will, you've got to prove to him that he is wasting his energy, Amen. his efforts, his time trying to fight against you. Amen. Otherwise, he will continue to do so. If he knows, oh, this brother, this sister, they got a weak spot right here, and I'm just going to pick on that weak spot forever, I'll, he'll do it. I promise you, he's got a lot of time on his hands. More time than you do to just sit there and mess with you. He'll do it. You've eventually got to prove to him you're wasting your time, pal. Your energy is not going to succeed. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. And the first word of this verse says, submit. Everybody say, submit. Submit Submit yourselves to God. Now, the Bible says these, they are two very clear and distinct, different actions that you are supposed to take. Resisting the devil is not the same thing as submitting to God. Submitting to God is not the same thing as resisting the devil. Otherwise, it would not have separated them there that way. I think a lot of times we we just get it in our mind. Well, if I just submit to God, just try to do what God tells me, try to make myself available to God, then that's going to take care of the devil issue. It's not. You've also got to resist him. And I think... That a lot of times we convince ourselves, well, if I just resist the devil, if I just make sure I'm staying out of his crosshairs and I'm resi- and he knows that, you know, I, I'm not an easy target and I'm working against him, then we th- equate that to submitting to God. It's not the same thing. You've got to do both. This verse tells us very plainly you've got to do both. Submit to God and Resist the devil. The word submit. This is just coming straight from the the Strong's Concordance. It is a Greek military term. It means to arrange troop divisions in a military fashion... Under the command of a leader. To submit means I'm I'm willing to fight, but I'm only willing to fight when, where, and how you tell me to fight. In a non-military use, it was a voluntary attitude of giving in, cooperating, assuming responsibility, and carrying a burden. All of those things mean to submit. So if I'm going to submit to God, I also have to be able to carry responsibility. 
If I'm going to submit to God, I have to be able to carry a burden. Not my burden, and I don't get to pick a burden. I let him give me a burden. And then I carry the responsibility of that burden. That is submission. Cooperating. Co operating is submission. Operating together with. Who am I doing this with? Who am I doing this to? To God. Submit yourself, therefore, unto God. I don't have time to to go there, so I'm not even going to try to read any verses. But I'm just going to mention to you, if you'll go look them up in Acts 4 and Acts 14, you see two very similar instances. Peter and John healing a lame man at the gate. Beautiful. And then people seeing this guy was healed. And then they immediately want to go heap praises upon Peter and John. And then similarly, Acts 14, Paul and Barnabas heal a lame man at, I believe it's Lystra. And immediately, but even more so, because this is not at the temple, and this is not among Jews, this is among heathens or or, uh, Greeks that think these guys are gods because Paul healed this man, they immediately want to heap praise upon Paul and Barnabas. They call call them uh, Jupiter and, I don't remember the, Mercurio, Zeus. That's who they think these guys are. Now, I'm talking about submission. I'm talking about cooperation. Peter, John, Paul, And Barnabas knew my role is submission. My role is cooperation. I have to operate with humility, like it's been talked about here tonight, in order to accomplish the will and purpose of God in my life. Do you realize that accomplishing the will of God can work against you If you allow the praises that people will want to give you, or dare I say that you would even seek yourself for accomplishing the will of God. God forbid you lay your hand on somebody that's sick and they get healed, and then somebody comes to give you praise and you accept that praise because things would have been better off if it didn't go that way. But in cooperation, in submission with God, if he uses me and he accomplishes his will, a healing, a blessing, whatever it is, and I don't let that go to my head and I don't get myself out of proper submission, God can continue to use that and operate that way. Stand with me, if you would, please. If you would close your eyes. We're just going to continue to let the Lord speak to us. You ought to be praying either about what it means to submit to God or resist the devil. Come on, I believe there is spiritual understanding here tonight about these things that the Lord is wanting to impart to us. And we've seen it in Scripture. We've got to do both. We've got to be able to do both. I've got to submit to God. I've got to make myself available to Him. I've got to humble myself. Allow Him to direct me. Allow Him to put me to work for His use, for His kingdom. 
and I've got to be able to withstand the devil. I've got to be able to stand against the devil, stand in opposition to the devil. This altar's open if you want to come and pray. I think we need to be spending some time in prayer here right now. We're going to let the Lord continue to speak to us. We're going to receive what He's wanting to give us, what he's, the, the direction, the instruction and understanding that He's wanting to impart to us tonight. I receive it from You, Lord God. I receive it from You, Lord Jesus. Your direction for my life. 